so we're very privileged to have an interesting group of people with interesting perspectives. Uh, Eugene White from Rutgers University is going to talk to us a little bit about the, the history of financial crisis and the role of supervision in it. Very, that will, should be pretty stimulating. Uh, we are missing Bill Lang, who unfortunately couldn't be with us. He is doing work on stress testing in banks, uh, which, as you know, is a very large part of the supervisory process today. Uh, next, we'll have Joe Hughes, who is going to talk about the elusive scale economies in uh, banking, and that should be, I think, quite stimulating, especially in a world where people worry about too big to fail. Um, next, we should, we'll have uh, Graydon Pollan, who we're very privileged to have here from the Bank of Canada, who will be talking about lessons from the financial crisis. Um, I will wrap up with a very short um, uh, exposition, just talking a little bit about you know what you heard and where are we, and uh, and then we're going to have a couple of questions from the panel uh, to the panel from the moderator, which is me, and uh, then we're going to throw it open to you for questions. So if that gives you a sense of the program. So of course, why is this uh, question so uh, important? Next time must be different. Uh, what's happening with financial reform. As you know, we do have a tremendous number of financial reform efforts um, underway, not just in uh, our individual countries, but also at the international level through the Financial Stability Board, uh, which is a relatively new body uh, that is comprised of the G20 countries, uh, also through traditional organizations like the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, IOSCO, which covers securities, et cetera. So at a time when so much is happening and yet we don't seem to be fully out of uh, financial crisis, um, still worried about things like failure and what the impact will be or whether in fact we'll have the will to pull the trigger in the public sector, um, it is I think a very interesting time to talk about what's changing, how it's changing, and what we think the impact might be. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Eugene White, who will do uh, pre his presentation on the, the history. So do I just click the... No. Okay. So I'm the history guy, and what I'm going to talk to you about is, from a historical perspective, what should be expected from banking supervision. And to start, I thought it would take an article which really caught my eye in the New York Times <clears throat> earlier this year. Uh, it was the front page, right-hand column in the New York Times. And it's, it says, scores of federal regulators are stationed inside J.P. Morgan's Manhattan quarters, but none of them were assigned to the powerful unit that recently disclosed a multi-billion dollar trading loss. Roughly 40 examiners from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York <clears throat> and 70 staff members from the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, no one for me to upbraid here, uh, are embedded in the nation's largest bank. Embedded meaning that they stay there full time. They are typically assigned to departments undertaking the greatest risks, like structured products trading desk. Even as the chief investment office swelled in size and made increasingly large bets, regulators did not put any examiners in the unit's offices in London or New York, according to a former regulators who spoke only on condition of anonymity. So, um, shocking. Absolutely shocking and appalled. The newspaper screamed for uh, you know, the readers to be just this complete failure of supervision. But how are we going to interpret this? Because a part I want to ask, what are reasonable expectations for supervision? And look with that in a historical context. The little bit of context here is you had 110 examiners in J.P. Morgan Chase, and there are 262,000 employees. You might get an idea that their task is not impossible, but extremely difficult uh, if you think you're going to catch all the, uh, what you might regard as excessive risk taking. So I'm going to take two approaches to try and look at this. One is a bigger picture, looking at supervision in the context of the general design of the financial system, and then look, do some historical comparisons within that framework. And the second is look at the evolving American system of supervision, particularly its federal character in, in some ways, and look at issues of fine tuning. Maybe, I don't think there's much, a lot of 
practical advice here, but overall guidance. So what's the big picture? Well, you know, so I, my big picture I mean here is how does one design a system? And we'll look at how the, you might want to look at the system design from the national banking and the system in the 19th century to what I like to call the post-post New Deal world. Think of a financial system this way, is that the public delegates authority to the government to do a variety of things. One thing they do is to set bank regulations. Those are all the rules governing capital reserves and so forth. It also sets liability rules. And by that, I mean penalties and incentives for management, shareholders, and all the other stakeholders involved. It also delegates supervision to an agency to monitor and discipline banks. And then the government, in some way, should monitor and discipline the agencies, if you want to complete the loop here. What about the national banking system from 1864 to 1913, the pre-Fed system? We have to look at this in two dimensions, both the federal level and the state level. And at the federal level, banks at this time, there are no capital ratios. There are some minimum requirements for entry, but no capital ratios whatsoever. Reserves are pretty high. For most banks, it's about 15%, but you can hold half of that in cash and half in designated depositories, usually big city banks. In investments, there are some limits, severe limits on real estate, um, and there are maximums of loans to any individual or any individual business, about 10% of capital. In terms of what I like to call constraints on economies of scale, branching is prohibited. In terms of economies of scope, they do a lot of variety of activities. There are certain things they can't do. One is they can't deal in stocks, because that's ultra is beyond their powers. But they can do some limited brokerage and investment banking activities. The states generally set a much weaker set of regulations, whether you look at capital reserves and so forth. And what you get is actually, over the course of the, of the 19th century, a little bit of competition between the federal and the state authorities, what's known as competition in laxity. And of course, that produces, as we all know, regulatory arbitrage with, with banks moving back and forth between these to try and find the right, or minim, the right set of regulations that fit them. The result of this, overall, is you have simple light rules and thousands of small single office banks, which are linked through a system of correspondent banks and large correspondents, which are in the large cities. And it's fairly good at funding medium and small size businesses with large firms going to the capital markets. Our Canadian hosts here will, of course, laugh at all this because they had a branching system, which makes ours look um, certainly very primitive by some dimensions. So that's regulation. What about liability rules? Shareholders in the US in, in, for national banks had double liability. That meant that when the comptroller of the currency, uh, who was the regulator, when the comptroller of the currency deemed a bank was potentially insolvent, he could suspend its operations and appoint a receiver. If the receiver thought there was a deficiency, he could immediately assess all the shareholders up to the par value of the stock. Of course, we can imagine what the incentive effect is, is that shareholders of stock are going to pay a little bit more attention to the operations and activities of officers and managers. And this is actually part of the design feature of the law. The, senators, uh, the Senate, which was writing at the time, discussed this issue as important. For depositors, there's no deposit insurance, so they ought to pay attention very carefully which banks they choose to put their money in. Directors don't fly in once or twice a year. They meet actually usually twice weekly, and they own a fair degree of shares. And officers own some shares. Never overwhelming. There's still large numbers of shareholders in the bank. So in that sense, it represent, they, were, they look like modern banks. But oftentimes, they have to post bonds, which are multiples of their salary. So the result is there are very strong incentives to monitor all, by, by all the major sta stakeholders to monitor uh, risk taking. The states provide an interesting contrast because these rules are weaker. Oftentimes, they have single liability. And, they, the uh, state regulator can't immediately suspend a bank. So they're weaker uh, in many ways, and sometimes they offer deposit insurance. What about supervision, sort of the third pillar here of the system? Well, for the national system, there are five call reports a year, three on surprise dates, because they recognize the possibility of window dressing. And there are two examinations. They're surprises. That is, the banks never quite know when they're going to reach, arrive in town. And when they do the valuations, they try and use market valuation uh, for looking at examinations. How big is their staffing? Well, in 1907, there are 100 examiners employed by the OCC and 6,400 banks. So a small force for what you're doing. And what about discipline? What kind of powers do they have? Well, they can send fines for late reports, about $100, not 
huge. They, there's a certain amount of moral suasion which the comptroller exerts via correspondence. But their only real sanction is to promptly close a bank if it's insolvent. And they do this. How do, I, how do we know this? Well, there are 540 banks suspended over a 50-year period. But after suspending them, they realize some of them are not insolvent, so they reopen 39, leaving 501 for insolvent. In other words, they're willing to take some risk of closing banks which are on the margin, which is pretty, I would say, typical today. The states are likewise weaker in all these dimensions. They have fewer reports, fewer examinations, and weaker discipline. So what are the consequences of all this? Yes, there are panics in the 19th century, and I could tell you great stories about all the banking panics. But part of this is in, this is in large part because we don't have a central bank to provide liquidity. Now, the Fed, when it arrives in 1913, solves, for a large part, the liquidity problem. Uh, but it doesn't really alter, in most of its dimensions, the system of supervision. And what are the con what, how, does this, how does this show up in terms of losses? Well, for national bank failures, for this 50-year period, there are just over 500 banks that fail. Depositors receive 77% of proven claims, and they have $44 million of losses, roughly over a 50-year period, about a billion dollars in today's money and a tiny fraction of GDP. For my light, that's pretty good. Now, you might argue that you don't want depositors to absorb any losses, but if you consider the amount of losses which are transferred to other banks and taxpayers, this seems really small. So you have light regulations, light supervision, and strong incentives, and I'll tell you minimal congressional oversight. But fine-tuning does matter because you can see the difference between the state and federal. And I have two graphs here. This is to show you what, what the incentives produced. The red line are insolvent banks. This is the percentage of national banks which become insolvent in any year. And the black line are voluntary liquidations. That is a phenomenon which is not apparent, it doesn't happen today as far as I know, is that boards of directors, if the bank was not successful and it looked like it was going south, they would voluntarily liquidate the bank and pay out all the creditors in full. So they would stop before the bank would, would, would get in trouble. And you can see it's about, it turns out these voluntary liquidations are about four times as high. So this is the way in which the system prevented large losses. Um, it may not be apparent, I don't know how well you can see this, but there are three classes of banks here. There are national banks and then two types of state chartered institutions, state banks and trust companies. This is the percentage of insolvencies. And the, just to get the point here is that you have the black line, which is the percentage of failing national banks. Above that sits state banks, which are more lightly regulated and supervised and weaker incentives. And above that are trust companies, which are even lighter than all those. So in many ways, these are more risk taking. Uh, institutions, They're, they have weaker incentives, they take more risk, they actually have lower capital and uh, higher failure rates. So pretty much what we predict. What changes in this system? Pretty much carries through this way all the way to 1932. With the New Deal, you get, you get a much more severe level of regulation, particularly a reduction of competition in price, geography, and product. You also get pressure on the banks to lengthen their loan maturities to compensate for the loss of the capital market, which is pretty much shut down. And in terms of the incentives, double liability is eliminated. So you take that away from shareholders, and you add deposit insurance. Also, often officers' bonds are eliminated, and directors meet less frequently. So there's a, there's a real weakening of this leg of the uh, I'd say the banking system, but supervision is increased. There's increased staffs, budget, and they're given much more discretion and more disciplinary powers. This is, you know, sailing over 40 years of history, but I think that's the general direction. What about the post-New Deal period? Well, you have more crises and lobbying to reduce barriers. You get still much more regulation of certain types, but also a, de a partial deregulation in terms of product, price, and geography. In terms of liability, there's, there's creep. There's less and less incentives for various stakeholders. For instance, in terms of deposit insurance, it starts out very limited, with only 45% of deposits covered. By the time you get to 1980, it's virtually not, it's well over 90%, plus all these other um, entities which are v for different institutions providing deposit insurance. You also get too big to fail, and in various ways, the roles of uh, the, the, the penalties for officers and directors are weakened. So you get 
a mixed, you get partial deregulation of regulations. You get um, increased, uh, decreased liability uh, for very different stakeholders, and supervision is strengthened. There's a, ten, a trend towards increased responsibility and powers. So there's increased ability for the system, banks to take risk, and you charge supervision with handling this. But this makes it all the more sensitive to political cycles of regulation and deregulation, plus the, the power, the fact they have increased discretion. So how does this kind of stack up if we look at this in comparison? What about depositor losses? And these are always a little bit difficult to compare because eventually, of course, depositors don't lose anything. Instead, it's the deposit insurance funds plus other banks and maybe even uh, their off-balance sheet, you know, raising funds through the bond market. But between 1864 and 1913, there's about a billion dollars in losses. The Great Depression is about 20 billion. The SNL period of uh, crisis and banking crisis of the early 80s, about 200 billion. And today, well, at least we think of that order of magnitude or somewhat larger, higher. So what we've done is we've progressed from light regulation um, with a competitive financial system to intense regulation, um, and then moved to deregulation with a competitive system of many regulations aimed at controlling risk taking, while the incentives to control risk by all the stakeholders have been vastly reduced. And you have light supervision moving this. So if you ask what lesson do I take from history is that if you want to prevent next time, what you've done is you've put too much weight on, on, on supervision. It's not possible for those 110 examiners to conceivably control all the margins of risk taking at J.P. Morgan Chase without having some counter, without having an increased uh, liabilities in that sense. Now, it does turn that, that fine-tuning matters. I mean, you, what it sounds like is I'm saying, well, you really need a major change in the way we uh, design our system. I would argue that's true, but the, the fine-tuning on the margins does matter. And it shows, comes from the evidence when you compare the performance of national and state banks in this earlier period. Uh, what might one conceive would happen? Well, con some consolidation of the agencies. I know this is a very touchy subject, but I think this is to help minimize the, uh, the uh, competition and laxity we know that the Dodd-Frank had actually merged two agencies, but the tremendous resistance to that was huge. And providing some support for the agencies, trying to make them less subject to the boom, bust, and political cycles. There's a huge, we're not really aware of that. I mean, Cong you know, we can blame the agencies, but really it's the Congress which delegates and provides them with resources. And each agency is funded differently, and you can see the political cycle works through them somewhat differently. So it's vital if you want to maintain reasonable supervision to maintain the number and quality of the supervisory staff. And one simple picture to try and show you this, I hope you can see this, it's very difficult to get comparable data from each agency. But this is simply nothing more than the number of, of bank examiners and supervisors from 1935 all the way to 2010 for the FDIC. And I've tried to put this all together. I don't like linking data when it it doesn't look like it's probably linked, so I have two, three points. I say data discontinuity. That's because somewhere in the data, they've changed the heading. I'm not sure why. The few, few, few first two data discontinuities, I'm fairly certain don't matter, that they're just a little change in nomenclature. The last one, the data discontinuity work, is what happened is that they decided to merge the data for uh, safety and sound, merge the numbers on safety and soundness examiners with consumer uh, uh, ex examiners. So it makes it, pushes the number up. So I think there's my little line corrected meanings that you would have a actually bigger decline. Well, what do you see here? You see there's the, uh, what I call the regula Reagan regulatory restraint, where even though the FDIC is funded by uh, largely the premium, they're still under considerable pressure to downsize, and you can see the drop in examiners. Then, of course, the financial crisis, there's the boom, goes back to normal, and then what I would call subprime forbearance. There's a slow to steady decline in the number of examiners, and of course, then a correction afterwards. So it is subject to these booms. The US is not unique um, in this respect. Uh, just to get you a sense that it's not just an American phenomenon, my friend who works at the Norges Bank, saw this graph and said, oh, I can do the same thing for Norway. And this is the on-site inspections per bank. And uh, by, I 
think by, there are two different agencies in, in Norway, and by the Savings Bank Guarantee Fund, and they fall quite dramatically before the uh, 1990s crisis, and then they rise again. So the same thing is observable in many other countries. Um, so lastly, what's the appropriate role of supervision? What, how should we scale the expectations? So I thought the last thing would leave you what, how people, how the two prominent individuals considered what the role of supervision should be. That it, and the first of these is one of the most prominent bankers of the time, the head of the First National Bank of Chicago. And he says, supervision by examination does not, however, carry with it the control of management and cannot therefore be held responsible for either errors of judgment or lapses of integrity. Examination is always an event after the act, having no control over a bank's initiative, which rests exclusively with the executive officers and directors and depends entirely on their business ability, judgment, and honesty of purpose. Obviously, this conflicts a lot with the New York Times sort of presentation. But last one, my favorite one from one of the comptrollers himself, it says it can be scarcely be expected if a robber or a forger is placed in control of all its assets that a national bank can be saved from disaster by the occasional visits of an examiner. In other words, you shouldn't put too much expectations there. You really ought to be more concerned about how uh, with the incentives behind uh, the uh, officers, shareholders, and directors. Thank you. Well, let, <clears throat> let me thank Chris first for organizing this session and inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm going to talk about the elusive scale economies of the largest financial institutions and their implications for global competitiveness. Um, these institutions have had some rather harsh critics, and uh, here's an example from Richard Fisher, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Hordes of Dodd-Frank regulators are not the solution. Smaller, less complex banks are. We can select the road to enhanced financial efficiency by breaking up too big to fail banks now. And Sheila Baer, the former CEO of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the public policy benefits of smaller, simpler uh, banks are clear. It may be in the enlightened self-interest of shareholders as well. Uh, and just to emphasize the point about the self-interest of shareholders, Phil Purcell says, breaking these companies into separate businesses would double to triple the shareholder value of each institution. But a more um, measured commentary is from uh, Governor Dan Tarullo of the Federal Reserve. Generally, though, even where intuition suggests economies in some other areas, such as breadth of securities distribution networks and the ability to provide uh, all forms of financing in significant amounts, evidence for the existence of such economies is limited and mixed. Moreover, even where significant scale is necessary to achieve certain economies, an important question will be what the minimum efficient scale, or perhaps more realistically, uh, the minimum feasible scale actually is. Is it possible that a firm would need to be quite large and diversified to achieve these economies, but still not as large and diversified as some of today's firms have become? So Governor Tarullo asks uh, two important questions. Are scale economies at the largest financial institutions elusive or illusive? <laughs> and if such economies exist, is it possible that they can be achieved by smaller institutions than the largest we observe today? And I'm going to try to provide some evidence on those questions. In fact, I'm going to discuss this trade-off between systemic risk and efficiency at large institutions. Is the trade-off genuine? That is to say, uh, is the size of the largest financial institutions the result of technological advantages that improve the efficiency of capital allocation and liquidity, or is it the result of safety net subsidies, uh, such as too big to fail, uh, that confer a funding cost advantage on the largest institutions? And the answer to these, this question uh, would also shed light on whether restricting scale 
uh, would reduce the uh, cost efficiency and global competitiveness of the largest financial institutions. So the issues I'll address rather briefly, what are scale economies, what are their technological sources, how are they measured, and most importantly, why are they so hard to detect? And is evidence of scale economies at the largest financial institutions due to too big to fail subsidies rather than technology? And finally, the effect of restrictions on size and global competitiveness. So what are scale economies? Well, scale economies look at how minimum cost varies with output. So if we consider a proportional increase in output, a less than proportional increase in cost, uh, which would be a cost elasticity less than one implies economies of scale, which are often measured by the inverse of that cost elasticity, which would be greater than one. On the other hand, an increase, a proportional increase in output that more than proportionately increases cost would imply cost elasticity greater than one in diseconomies of scale. Uh, what are the technological sources of scale economies? Well, the standard textbook explanation of scale economies associated with larger outputs points to spreading the overhead, especially costs associated with information technology, uh, points to diversification of liquidity risk, diversification of credit risk, and the result of better diversification from larger sizes that relatively fewer resources are required to manage liquidity and credit risk, uh, and also uh, more recently work has pointed to network economies and payments. What then are bank costs? Uh, interest expense on borrowed funds, non-interest expense on labor and physical capital, and then the quantity of, or the price, the cost of equity capital, and some accounting for uh, non-current assets. What are bank outputs <clears throat> in this sort of cost measurement? Well, outputs, typically take some combination of loans, which could be balance sheet loans as well as loans sold and securitized, uh, liquid assets, securities, trading assets, and off-balance sheet <coughs> activities. And what's the relationship of cost to output? Well, in the standard study, there's some assumption of cost minimization. Uh, a cost function is estimated which represents the minimum cost of a given set of outputs of the type I've just described uh, as a function of input prices and those inputs I described. Uh, and if it's properly specified, it would have some accounting for equity capital uh, and asset quality, the non-current assets. And the common finding of these studies is that there are slight scale economies at smaller banks uh, and scale diseconomies at larger banks. And this very common finding was summarized by Alan Greenspan in a paper called The Crisis. And I'll quote it, uh, for years the Federal Reserve has been concerned about the ever larger size of our financial institutions. Federal Reserve research has been unable to find scale economies in banking beyond a modest sized institution. Uh, is that claim credible? Well, here are some reasons why we might think it's not credible without turning explicitly to the data. Textbooks assert that scale economies characterize banking. Larger institutions have historically continued to grow larger. Uh, larger institutions offer financial products and services not available at smaller institutions and institutions merge to create larger institutions, but of course, all of this increasing size could be uh, in response to too big to fail subsidies rather than to technological uh, cost advantages. Well, who's found evidence, looking at the data, who's found evidence of scale economies at large banks? Here's a list which is illustrative but not exhaustive, and I've put asterisk by former or current Federal Reserve economist. And next to the question, why are scale economies then so hard to detect? Why is it that uh, this list of papers, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's longer than that, but not a great deal longer. Uh, why, is, why are they hard to detect? And the answer is endogenous risk taking. Uh, let me explain. Better diversification that results as banks get bigger uh, improves their risk return frontier. 
and it lowers the marginal cost of risk management. And larger institutions tend to take more res risk in response to the improved frontier. And the di better diversification, in a sense, lowers the cost elasticity, generates scale economies, but the extra risk taking to the extent that it's costly uh, raises the cost elasticity and can obscure uh, the scale economies. Uh, so here's an example, the smaller bank uh, with the lower frontier and uh, output increases and as a result of better diversification, uh, the larger bank has an improved risk return frontier. The smaller bank has an investment strategy that generates the expected return and risk at point A. If the larger bank did nothing but just enjoy its larger size, it would have uh, lower costs of average cost of risk management and a higher expected return and lower risk and it would wind up at point B. And at point B, we would, if we measured scale economies in the standard way that I described, we'd find economies of scale, a cost elasticity less than one. But in response to the better diversification, the larger bank may actually take more risk. For example, point C, and to the extent that extra risk is costly, we might actually measure from the standard cost function study that their constant returns to scale at point B. Now remember, there are scale economies here, so we're getting a biased uh, reading. But if the bank took even more risk, uh, point D, for the higher expected return, we might find that uh, there are measured diseconomies of scale at the largest banks. And so what uh, the evidence is telling us is that the small bank enjoys small scale economies and the large bank has diseconomies of scale. And I think that's a, a biased reading because uh, there are actually two effects going on. The larger scale reduces cost elasticity, other things equal. We'll call this the diversification effect, but additional risk taking may increase cost elasticity, other things equal. We'll call this the risk taking effect. And I'm arguing that uh, we may actually be finding at large banks diseconomies of scale because the risk taking effect overwhelms the diversification effect and masks the scale economies. And there are reasons to believe that large banks take more risk. There's a paper by Marcus, a famous paper that argues that banks with valuable growth opportunities take low risk or pursue low risk investment strategies to protect their charter while banks with poorer growth opportunities take high risk investment strategies to exploit safety net subsidies. And um, Typically, the large banks are the banks with the lower valued investment opportunities. And there's empirical evidence, I've cited a few papers that uh, show this. So we'd expect to find the large banks at point D, and we measure diseconomies of scale by standard uh, techniques. Well, this standard mis the standard minimum cost function then uh, ignores endogenous risk taking and uh, for the, all the reasons I've just stated, uh, uh, probably gives us the suspicious or results we should doubt about diseconomies of scale at the largest financial institutions. Now, in work I've done with Loretta Mester at the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank, and Bill Lang also there, and Chungul Moon, in Korea, we've uh, estimated uh, a cost function that accounts for uh, endogenous risk taking. It's actually a, a cost function driven by expected return and risk. And we were able to separate out or, or get control for risk taking. And, uh, and we find evidence of scale economies when we do this. So what I'd like to present to you is some um, evidence from 2007 of a cost function estimated in the standard way and estimated in this alternative way and show you what we get. So this, these are 842 top tier bank holding companies, which means they're not owned by anybody else. Uh, these are US top tier bank holding companies in 2007. And so you're looking at a column uh, broken down by size groups of banks uh, and these are their cost elasticities. And so you remember a 10% increase in cost for the small banks implies a 9.7% uh, 
increase, or sorry, 10% increase in output applies a 9.7% increase in cost. So there are economies of scale at the small banks. And they're significantly different from one all the way up to banks to uh, $100 uh, billion. But in the largest bank, uh, systemically important banks greater than $100 billion, we have constant returns to scale, not significantly different from one. Uh, some of the animations lost here. But uh, here's a, another cost function. Uh, this is a standard cost function, but it's conditioned on the level of equity, and I won't go through the technical details of this, but we're still basically on this cost function. We expect to give biased results for large banks. And you'll see that the cost elasticity is greater than one for all banks, and in fact, the cost elasticity is rising as you get to larger banks. So this is diseconomies of scale uh, for all of them, and had the animation work, that whole column would be this would be pointing to the entire column, that bullet. Um, here's a third one, which includes the cost of equity capital. Uh, it's, again, a, mis a minimum cost function that isn't accounting for this endogenous risk-taking. And you'll see that, uh, again, there are slight economies of scale at the smaller banks. But when we get to that last row, which is the $100 billion banks, the systemically important banks, uh, it's not significantly different from one, so it's constant returns to scale there. So increasing returns to scale until we get to the last, which is uh, constant returns to scale. So all these sort of standard cost functions, variants of the standard cost function, are generating essentially the same results that Chairman Greenspan uh, characterized. But now let's add this risk return driven cost function that's attempting to uh, capture the extra costs from risk taking. And you'll notice that all of those uh, cost elasticities are significantly less than one. And, oops, uh, we've lost lots of animation here. Uh, they're all significantly less than one, and they're getting smaller as banks get larger, and the systemically important banks, the cost elasticity of 0.74, which means a 10% increase in output results in a 7.4% increase in cost, compared to an 8.8% increase in cost for the smallest banks. And so the question Governor Tarullo raised of whether uh, there is some point at which you could find banks that are smaller than the current banks, but uh, uh, still enjoy scale economies, and the answer is, well, yes, uh, you could take that second category where the cost elasticity is 0.81, but it's still rather much bigger than the systemically important banks uh, at 0.74. So let's just look at the results for systemically important banks uh, under the standard cost functions, constant returns to scale, decreasing returns to scale, constant returns to scale, and the increasing returns from that cost function I was telling you that's accounting for risk return decisions. Well, some robustness checks. You could sort of say, well, how do you know this isn't too big to fail at, operate, at operating here, which is resulting in that cost elasticity? So we have estimated this for, and gotten similar results for other years. Uh, and if we take those 2007 data, whose results we were just looking at, and we drop smaller institutions, institutions less than two billion, and estimate it, we get the same results for the remaining size groups. If we drop institutions larger than 100 billion, the systemically important banks, and estimate it, and then uh, infer out of sample the scale economies of the largest banks, we get essentially the same results, nothing changes. Well, suppose we take the estimates that I just presented to you and we uh, calculate the scale economies of the systemically important banks, but we give them the cost of funds, the median cost of funds or the, the, for banks less than 100 billion. So if there's a funding advantage for banks greater than 100 billion, we'll give those 100 billion dollar larger banks the cost of funds of the smaller banks, and what do we get? Well, we, we still get large scale economies. Uh, so we argue that uh, the evidence is fairly strong, that it's technology and not too big to fail, uh, which is generating these results. Uh, so Governor Tarullo then raises another question. Uh, 
An additional concern would arise if some countries uh, made the trade-off by limiting the size or configuration of their financial firms for systemic risk reasons at the cost of realizing genuine economies of scale and scope while other countries did not. In this case, firms from the first group of countries might well be at a competitive disadvantage in the provision of certain cross-border activities. Uh, well, we have some evidence on this. Uh, Wheelock and Wilson uh, have an interesting paper that finds scale economies at all sizes. And they take their four largest institutions, these data are from 2009, US data, and they scale these institutions back to $1 trillion in size, and they create enough institutions to equal the output of the original group. And they find that cost is 9% higher uh, for these scale back trillion dollar institutions. The trillion dollar institutions, of course, are still very big. So uh, Loretta and I do a different calculation. We take the 17 largest institutions in 2007, greater than $100 billion, scale them back to $100 billion, and increase the number of them until we've produced the same total output as the unscaled banks, and we get uh, just about 11% higher cost of the scale-back banks, which suggests that uh, such institutions uh, would be at a competitive disadvantage in those cross-border activities, though the general equilibrium solution uh, uh, we haven't tried to imagine. Um, so uh, our conclusions, scale economies are hard to detect. Uh, because of this problem of endogenous risk taking, uh, but the largest financial institutions we believe experience large scale economies, the largest scale economies of all, and these scale economies result from technology rather than too big to fail subsidies. And so restrictions on size then are likely to reduce the global competitiveness of these banks. Thank you. Well, you know, we all like to brag and talk about our own our own banking systems and how well they did. But, you know, I, I would just say we I, I go up. I do this very cautiously because it's when you brag that then things turn bad, <laughs> and there are some risks out there. So, well, I will point to some positive factors about the Canadian experience. I will also point to a few of the risks. Uh, let's see if this works. Here we go. So I'm going to, uh, there's going to be three parts to my presentation today. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the relative performance of the Canadian banking sector. Uh, but then I would like to uh, move on and present some international evidence on factors contributing to differences in bank performance during the financial crisis. And the idea is to identify some positive factors and then compare that against the, the Canadian banking sector and see if there's some features we can point to. And then finally, uh, I would like to sum up by a few reflections on Canadian banking history and then the implications of all this for, for um, regulatory reform going forward. It is true that uh, the Canadian banking sector has never experienced a banking crisis as traditionally defined in the literature. That is not to say, however, that we have not had some significant problems in our history. And I'll just point to a couple of them as I go through this. And I think those have been very important in sort of defining what sort of supervisory and banking structure that we have today. Uh, and finally, I should note that this is actually joint work with a colleague of mine from the Canadian Supervisory Office, uh, Neville Arjani. So let me just uh, talk a bit about what we experienced during the financial crisis. Um, what I have here, sorry, I recognize that the, the, uh, the chart is not very large, but the specific numbers don't really matter. It's really the, the comparisons to the other lines. Um, this is, let me start off with funding pressures. This is just a measure of short-term funding costs uh, in various uh, regions of the world. Canada is in red. And I think uh, what I want to point out here is we were not unaffected by the financial crisis. Even though our banking system, even at that time, was viewed as performing, or at least perceived to be performing fairly well, we were hit rather hard. Funding costs rose quite dramatically. And I think this is a rather harsh lesson or harsh evidence of, of the forces of cross-border contagion. They can be significant, even for systems that appear to work well. However, we were not hit nearly as hard as elsewhere. 
And the other lines that I have there are the US, the UK, and the Euro area. And you can see, for example, the spike during the crisis was much more modest. But as I said, we were not unaffected. And actually, we had to reduce a number of our own liquidity support programs. Uh, at the Bank of Canada, we adjusted our short-term liquidity support programs quite substantially. We adjusted the maturities, the eligible securities, the, uh, um, the counterparties that could be used in the amounts. And our federal government also introduced longer-term support measures, usually based on insured residential mortgages. So again, nobody gets off scot-free in an episode like this. But we did, uh, we were not uh, hit as hard as some systems that were perceived as to be in worse shape. And I'll just point to the most recent episode. You can see some increased volatility just toward the end of the chart. That, of course, is more the focus of the European financial crisis. Canada, again, is red there. And you can see in this case, we were, uh, it's a flat line, which is nice to see. Uh, we were unaffected. In terms of uh, actual losses, um, our banks had a very modest loss experience. Uh, credit charge off rates were quite low, and cumulative write downs, which captures more your trading book activity, also remained very low. And as a, as a result, return on equity, ROEs in Canada, uh, among the major banks as a group, remained highly positive, 10% or more, uh, right through the crisis. Uh, I'm sure you can find a quarter or, or two where it was less, but at least on annual average, it was very positive. What was a little surprising here was, okay, we seem to be performing well relative to some of the other jurisdictions that I put up here. What surprised us was we were actually performing quite well relative to our own historical experience. We've gone through recessions, financial disruptions, and we had some serious problems. We weren't experiencing it this time. So of course the question is what's different? Um, part of the answer may be in the housing sector. <clears throat> this is not actually the area I'm going to go into. There are a number of papers that look in di at differences in mortgage financing in Canada, the U.S., and in other jurisdictions. It's not the focus of my, um, my talk today, but it would be incomplete if I didn't at least mention the housing sector. As you can see from here, we had sustained strength throughout. Again, the red, line, uh, red lines are Canada, and on the left side, you'll see housing prices. Now, these are national... Uh, house price indices, they are not directly comparable because countries tend to, to measure their house prices in different ways. But I think they give you uh, a general story. And that is, you can see the Canadian house prices moved up almost throughout. We had a, a small downturn for a couple of quarters, but then you can see uh, they quickly recovered. And this was in sharp contrast to the downturn in housing sectors that you saw elsewhere. And uh, related to that, on the right-hand side where you see uh, mortgage delinquencies, this is just compared to the U.S. experience, remain quite low in Canada. So we had this very positive uh, dynamic here where uh, strong housing sector, uh, losses were uh, minimal to, to our banking system, and therefore intermediation was maintained. So a very positive element in, in that respect. And then the final element I want to point to in terms of performance are a potential factor on performance is the relatively small shadow banking sector. Quite a debate as to the extent to which it contributed to problems elsewhere, uh, but it still remains that it's relatively small within Canada and the composition is different. What shadow banking sector we do have, I would say is oriented towards less risky activities. But here, another lesson, does not mean that we do not have problems. We had a non-bank asset-backed commercial paper market and it completely shut down uh, at the beginning of the crisis. People became very concerned about the quality of the assets backing that. Um, they weren't sure. Uh, it was a great, great lesson in problems of lack of transparency. They, they could not tell what was in those assets and the whole market shut down and that is the um, sort of dark blue um, uh, chart, oh, sorry, bars on the left hand side there. You can see the dramatic decline that has occurred. So I want to shift gears just a little bit and, and look more towards um, the broader, uh, sorry, I'm just missing a, a sheet here. Just look uh, at some broader international evidence and get away a little bit from Canada. Uh, what we do here is we're looking for a relationship between the crisis performance or the, the performance of banks during the crisis and their pre-crisis conditions. And so we've done a very simple exercise. Simple, but we still think it's instructive. 
Uh, we collected data for 77 large global banks from over 20 economies. And then we divided them between what we considered to be bailed out banks and non-bailed out. All sorts of caveats here. Uh, we could spend the rest of the session going through them. Um, for example, what, do, what does one think is a bailed out bank? Some banks that took support uh, during the crisis would tell you that they were pressured uh, to take that support and they didn't need it. Non-bailed out banks, well, some of them that weren't bailed out might have needed, might, might have needed uh, capital support if they didn't receive the liquidity support that was introduced uh, worldwide at that time. So it's, uh, it's a tough measure. All I can say in our defense is my, my co-author and I came up with a definition that we were comfortable with and then we did not change it. We did not tweak it to try to change results. We just set, looked and saw what it did. So once we had that division, we then looked at the pre-crisis conditions identified on a bunch of, of financial metrics, including size, business model, funding model, capital adequacy, leverage, risk tolerance, cost efficiency, and balance sheet liquidity. And we just asked, we looked at, uh, we compiled this data, which was a task in itself, if, if you've ever looked at international banking data, to try to get comparable data across a number of, of countries and banking systems. Um, so what we came up with out of our sample was that uh, it was basically evenly split between banks we considered bailed out and non-bailed out. And as you would expect, the, the bailed out banks um, performed relatively poorly. Uh, the declines in their market capitalization were substantially larger, the return on assets were substantially worse, and uh, their charge off rates were considerably more than the non bailed out bank group. So that seems to make sense. That, that's all one can say there. So then we compared according to our various metrics. Now, uh, I realize you probably have a lot of trouble reading the, uh, the numbers in that table. Uh, if you can read them, your eyesight's a heck of a lot better than mine. But let me just give you the bottom line um, so that I can move on. Banks that performed relatively poorly in our sample, i.e. banks that were bailed out, they had larger trading businesses, greater reliance on short-term non-deposit sources of funding, lower regulatory capital, higher leverage, higher risk tolerance, lower cost efficiency, and lower balance sheet liquidity. I think all of those would accord with your intuition, and they all come out in our data. I'll admit up front, not always uh, significantly, but the two that really came out strongly were the funding model uh, and the business model. The business model we simply defined as the proportion of your business dependent on trading revenues, and the funding model is the proportion of your funding coming from short term, funding as opposed to longer term. These are very simple definitions, uh, I realize, but of course we had to find ones that, that we could use with our available data. But those were strongly evident. We also ran regressions on this data, and, and, and those results are, are available as well. But what, they, what the regression showed that this simple comparison didn't was that uh, risk tolerance was important. If you had a, a very large a relatively large tolerance for risk before the crisis, you were much more likely to get into trouble, uh, according to the regressions as the crisis hit. So how did uh, Canadian banks compare? And in fact, we compare Australian banks as well, because in fact, Australia uh, banking sector did exceedingly well during the crisis uh, as well. So it's interesting to look at them. Well, based on these metrics that we looked at, Canadian banks compared favorably based on their business model, funding model, capital adequacy, and risk tolerance. So it seems to make sense. Australian banks, when we looked at them, were also a positive outlier, and their business and funding model, again, was quite important, uh, was relatively stronger in Australia. Uh, their also leverage showed up. They had relatively low leverage in the Australian banking system, and that may have helped them. So that appears to, uh, that just provides some evidence. Uh, clearly, it, it, intuitively, it sort of makes sense. If you go into a crisis with an aggressive business model with a lot of trading activity uh, based on short-term funding, uh, you're probably asking for trouble. So that makes sense. Canadian banks did not seem to be so aggressive quite and have the same structure. So the relevant question, though, is why did that happen? Uh, what are the reasons? Uh, why did those banking structures and behaviors emerge that supported stability? There are many potential reasons, uh, many have been discussed, but I'm, I'm going to focus on one, which is really 
uh, you know, the thesis of this paper. And that is we believe our findings are consistent with a strong emphasis on robust risk management practices. And I'll talk a bit about that uh, in a moment. But first, why, you know, why was this evident, or do we believe it was evident in the Canadian system? And there, I think history matters. Um, I'm not an historian, but history is awfully interesting when you sort of go and look at it, uh, because it does tell you a lot as to, to why things are going on today, as, as was already discussed up here. Uh, I guess our feeling is that the current regulatory supervisory structure and more importantly, the attitudes that one finds is, is at least partly a result of some financial episodes in Canada, financial disruption. As I said, no banking crisis as traditionally defined, but we did have problems. The first I want to point to is the failure of two banks in 1985. Now, your reaction may be to, you know, so what? I, there are some jurisdictions where small banks can you know, fail on a regular basis. Let me point out that the last time we had a bank fail was 1923. So we went 60 years with no bank failures. And, you know, probably a lot of complacency as a result of that. And then all of a sudden we had two banks fail. Uh, they were small, less than 1% of the total banking system. But it was a shock. It actually it just happened to be about the time I started working for the central bank. And I, I can certainly attest that it was shocking. How could this happen? Who was responsible for responding? Everybody turned to the central bank assuming that the central bank would take charge. But we were not the supervisors. We were not in charge of resolution. Certainly, we were lender of last resort. So there's a certain amount of confusion. So after things got settled, which took a while, there was an inquiry and a certain number of changes made. Uh, mandates were improved. Uh, clarity was given. Incentives were improved to take action. A supervisor was created. This, there was a supervisory function, but it was a small division within our treasury a new office was created with expanded powers. But it wasn't just an office. Something else was created at the time, which I think was useful. Uh, communication was not terrific during that 1985 episode. Something had to be done. So they created a new um, committee, Financial Institution Supervisory Committee, which was a communications forum for all the key players in financial stability. Since that was put in place in the 80s, that meant it was there when the, uh, the crisis arrived uh, recently, and that was very useful. And actually, this crisis, um, earlier crisis, if I can call it, or disruption, um, created other useful changes. We improved our payment systems when it was evident that there were some problems there. Excuse me. So let me just point to uh, one other historical or a couple of other historical episodes before I sort of summarize, try to summarize what some of the lessons might be here. Um, I pointed out that we did not have a significant housing sector cycle in this most recent, uh, recent um, crisis. Well, in fact, that's atypical for us because we've had a number of significant housing sector cycles um, leading to substantial losses. The two largest ones, at least in my memory, were in the early 1980s and, the early, and again in the early 1990s. So we didn't learn. You know, the, we had a big housing bubble in the 1980s, uh, which burst, nominal housing prices fell, and we had a collapse in starts. And then we went through it again in the 1990s. A very strong speculative uh, bubble emerged, and this time commercial real estate got picked up. We had apartments being flipped. You know, Somebody would buy an apartment for 100 million one day and flip it for 120 million the second the next day, and people are asking, "How can that be? How can you see that?" Uh, the chart just shows you the uh, the real housing price movements during the, during those cycles. On the left hand side is the early 80s, and then the latter half of the 80s you see an increase. Then we had a decline again in the early 90s, and then uh, the the very right hand bars from the uh, the mid 90s to or sorry, the end of the 90s to to basically today. So we've had some substantial house price variation. We didn't in the most recent crisis, so it's interesting to think about that as well. Our banks suffered significant losses from these. They were not, their viability was not threatened, but certainly it promoted awareness of the impact that housing sector cycles could have on bank viability. So I do think uh, these events did have an impact on the regulatory structure you find uh, in Canada, or at least the one that we had as we went into the financial crisis. I think I've already mentioned um, FIST, Financial Institution Supervisory Committee. 
five institutions are, uh, it's composed of five institutions, our treasury, central bank, supervisor, uh, deposit insurer, and our consumer protection agency. That was an existing um, committee prior to the crisis, and it was used uh, right through the crisis. I mean, it, they talked at least on the phone daily, those institutions. So having that, um, that uh, committee there, I think, was very important. I think our supervisor, OSFI, uh, its approach to supervision regulation also reflects the history that I just talked about. I won't go into any detail here, but you can certainly see over the last 20 years an increased emphasis on evaluating material risk and the quality of risk management practices in the institutions. It's also true that they required capital to be significantly higher than the Basel II minim minimums, I should say, and, and higher generally than most uh, other jurisdictions. And we had a leverage ratio since the early 1980s. It is now part of Basel III, of course, but a leverage ratio, which for us includes some off-balance sheet items, was an existing element uh, in, in our regulatory structure. So let me take that to what I think are the lessons learned, and I'll sum up with uh, just a couple of slides here. Um, you know, the lesson I draw from the evidence we provided is sound risk management is absolutely key. Um, as I pointed, we did have some extra capital, we did have a leverage ratio, but my personal opinion is that was not the defining difference uh, for the Canadian financial system. Uh, rather, I think it was an eff emphasis on risk management, which may have emerged for a variety of reasons, although I point to the historical evidence as being, or historical developments as being one of those. Um, I think what you have to do, of course, is engage in ongoing monitoring of the evolution of an institution's exposures to risk. Uh, I think in our first presentation we heard that even though we saw a changing structure in some banks, our, our regulatory and supervisory structures did not change you know, sufficiently quickly or respond sufficiently quickly. What you have to focus on are those exposures or business changes that are occurring very rapidly. Of course, national and global regulatory structures that support risk management practices um, are important. Uh, you're all familiar, or at least heard about uh, Basel III. Um, but of course, it's not just Basel III. The global regulatory reform agenda includes a large variety of risk mitigating initiatives, such as encouraging putting derivatives through centralized counterparties. Um, so this is very important, but I don't think you can just rely on regulatory rules. They're necessary, they're part of it, but they can lead to arbitrage, and we've seen that. I, they set up their own set of incentives, uh, and some of those will be unintended. So what I think you have to do is develop an underlying attitude where risk management, robust risk management, is just taking the norm, as the norm, by your institutions. I, it's just the expectation coming out of the supervisor from the authorities that that's what's going to be done. There's no question about it. How do you accomplish that? Um, well, I think that would be the subject of a whole other presentation, but I think you know, historical experience is an element there. And then finally, clear communication structures, uh, I think, among the authorities, really minimizes conflicting messages. There was a world of difference between what happened to us in the 1980s when we had poor communication structures and then what happened more recently. Um, and I'm sorry, one more slide. I almost forgot about this. Um, I think the second set of lessons are the liquidity risk. And as I said, we had an, a, a, a banking system that was perceived to be performing relatively well, and yet we were hit fairly hard uh, on the liquidity side. It really was a harsh lesson, lesson in cross-border contagion. Um, so obviously, uh, um, we responded to that, but there was a lot to learn from it. I think what is important is strengthened liquidity frameworks in the banking system itself, emphasizing, in the first instance, private sources of liquidity. And it should be commensurate with their funding and business models. Uh, those are tremendously important in determining the risk elements of a bank, and their liquidity frameworks and their whole risk management practices have to be in line with that. So something we need to ensure in the future. And then for the authorities, uh, for people like myself, we have a lot to learn about the kinds of liquidity facilities that are most useful uh, in a crisis situation. And of course, we are uh, learning those lessons and adapting them to make sure they have adequate flexibility. So thank you. I think I'll stop there. <laughs>